Welcome back to the podcast, Can Silicon Valley Save Healthcare? The podcast where healthcare leaders talk about technology, technology leaders talk about healthcare, investors talk about impact, patients have a voice, and everyone has an opinion. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Can Silicon Valley Save Healthcare? I am your host, Adam Silverman, the Chief Medical Officer at Syllable. And today I am thrilled to have on as a guest of the podcast, Bobby Sapuka, the CEO of Cricket and the pending CEO of the merged entity of Cricket Health, Interwell Health, and Fresenius Medical Partners. Bobby, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, let's just jump right into it. I, I like to start with my guests to, to give our audience um, a little bit of a, of a view of who they are outside of, outside of work. And so I have a couple of icebreaker questions for you. Um, one of the things that, that we like to think about on the podcast is, is who's going to play us in our autobiography when our, when our startups become um, successful and uh, somebody writes the movie script about it. So who's going to play Bobby Sapuka in the uh, Cricket Health, uh, Interwell Health, and whatever else is to come uh, autobiography movie? Um, this is a terribly dangerous question because I'm sure everybody uh, thinks of a really, really good looking movie star to play them. So I guess I'll do this the same thing. I was once told I looked a little bit like Guy Pierce, uh, an Australian oh. actor who was uh, in one of my favorite movies, L.A. Confidential. So I, I'd go with Guy. Cr- Great movie and a great choice. I love it. Um, we'll have to see if he's available when the, when the yeah, autobiography exactly. comes out. And you also have to think about how you're going to look in 10 or 15 years when it does come out, too. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, with, with my chosen hairstyle, I've got, to, I've got to choose the actor who in 10 or 15 years is going to have a similar, similar hairstyle to my own. I was going to say, Guy is going to have to put a bald cap on for to play me. <laughs> I agree. And then second question, um, if you were going to uh, have dinner with, uh, with uh, an individual of your choice, um, either alive or deceased, fictional or non-fictional, who would you like to have dinner with and why? Um, so I was thinking about this the other day. I was coming up with all kinds of great fictional characters. And then at the risk of getting a little maudlin, I would have dinner with my father. Uh, my father passed away um, nine years ago now from ALS. Um, and it's probably the seminal experience or contact point I've had with the American healthcare system. Um, which in some respects was wonderful and in many respects was awful, which probably means it was a pretty fair representation. Uh, but yeah, right. I mean, my dad was my hero, miss him terribly and uh, having dinner with him would be pretty great. Yeah, I think um, my father passed away about 15 years ago as well as uh, from lung cancer. And I always think about, you know, what, what he's doing wherever he may be. And then, um, you know, if we ever had an opportunity to have that next conversation, you know, now that it's been 15 years, what, what would that conversation be like? So great choice. So um, I love your background. The first time we talked, I, I sort of asked you, I said, so you're a lawyer by training. How did you get involved in sort of a healthcare startup? Um, but um, then I, I listened to an interview that you did, and you sort of detailed your your career trajectory. You know, your law school education, um, the fact that you um, worked uh, for corporate counsel, you were chief of staff for a uh, for a U.S. Uh, representative, um, and you know, you sort of described your um, your superpower, if you will, as having the experience in politics, policy. And um, in business, and you thought that 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 combination not only was it unique, but it also gave you a unique perspective um, to make you successful in your in your current endeavor as CEO of a healthcare startup. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's funny. I, someone, I've always been among the youngest people uh, wherever I've worked, and I now realize that I'm among the oldest. Uh, and uh, someone called me a couple of months ago and said, "Hey, I, you know, I." I followed you a little bit. I see what you're done. I, I've, I mean, I'm just starting out. I'd love to emulate your career. And I burst out laughing and said, oh God, don't do that. It's this <laughs> crazy nomadic path. Um, I love where I've ended up and I've had a wonderful set of experiences, but um, I certainly, it was not all that well, well uh, thought out. So yeah, as you said, I started out in Silicon Valley a thousand years ago as a corporate lawyer, worked with venture capitalists and high tech startups. Um, I grew up outside of DC and my family was um, none of us were in politics, but we all read the Washington Post every single day and every single dinner uh, conversation seemed to be where we solved all the world's problems, um, at least according to us. 
And my friends growing up used to give me all kinds of grief when they'd come over and sit down and said, God, you guys talk about nothing but politics. But it was always in my blood. And when um, a dear friend of mine from, uh, from, from law school was a five-term congressman and he was running for U.S. Senate. And so uh, in 2004, he convinced me to leave the law, move down to D.C., take a 75% haircut and salary and become his chief of staff and then help him out with the campaign. And it was without question, one of the most fun things I've ever done and among the most rewarding professional things I've ever done. But there's a real lot, there's a reason why political campaigns are staffed by young single people. It was beyond grueling. Um, a wonderful, wonderful experience. After we lost narrowly, I then um, did what a lot of people do in DC, which is I joined a law firm and became a lobbyist, which was became my idea of hell because walking in the <laughs> halls of, of Congress saying, please pass HR 463 is, I didn't have any contact or context with why HR, why this bill was, this, that I was pushing was it, was of any interest to the American public or you know, what, what it meant. But I was connected to Fresenius, the large dialysis uh, provider, and um, was hired by um, a, a man who ended up becoming a dear friend and mentor. Um, to run government affairs for Fresenius. I didn't know what a kidney was. I really, again, wasn't a very good lobbyist, but became the head lobbyist for the biggest kidney company in the country and in the world. And what I realized was being inside the company um, was a wonderful vantage point for me. And given, especially in a highly regulated industry like healthcare and like kidney care, where 90% of dialysis patients are paid for by the federal government, all things policy matter an enormous amount. Yes, for the business and the bottom line, but for patients and how we engage with patients and physicians and how the whole ecosystem has evolved, is today, and will you know evolve in the future. And at the risk of sounding unbelievably arrogant, I don't think that there were many more people at the organization besides myself, given my vantage point, who saw how all of the cogs came together um, and how all of the you know, where all the levers were. So it was an amazing experience for about nine years. Um, I ended up leaving because I was honestly pre pretty thoroughly disgusted with the business model that is dialysis and kind of where the dialysis machine sort of, not the dialysis machine, but the, the whole ecosystem, how it's evolved right. and the unfortunate consequences of a policy decision back in 1972, which without question was the right thing and saved millions and millions of lives. So we can get into sort of why kidney care, but again, this this intersection between policy and business and politics um, there's a lot of people, especially today, who think politics is a dirty word for a lot of good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fascinating place to be. And I think ultimately, if we can get our act together as a society, is going to be the sort of what leads us, um, hopefully, into sort of the, the uh, a much more promise, promising future. Through this lens and through this personal experience that you've had and your professional experience, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask all of my guests. And I'd love your opinion. Is healthcare broken? Um, yeah, I, I have a, I'm, I have a hard time thinking it's not. I used to joke that it was not broken but severely strained, and then I got really depressed because I thought, well, gosh, if this isn't broken, what does broken look like? Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think that there are three big factors going on here. One, I, I think it's pretty clear that the market has failed. Um, we've got siloed specialties. We've got misaligned incentives. We've got abysmal customer service. I mean – short of, you know, air travel, I can't imagine, a, you know, sort of a worse customer service these days, um, a pretty consistent failure to take into account patients' preferences, um, absence of inter data interoperability, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and it's not like other sectors of the economy don't have issues, but they tend to get fixed. I mean, financial services is complicated. It involves highly sensitive data. And yet the market has delivered a highly diversified yet interconnected suite of services that I think by most accounts are received well. Um, the comparison to data has been used time and time again, but you look at what happened in financial services versus mm -hmm. what has happened and continues to happen in healthcare, it's, they're not, there's no comparison. Which leads me to sort of the one of the next pieces is, okay, you have this market failure in some way, shape or form, but you have no, uh, the public sector is either unwilling or unable to s step in and say, all right, You've got data interoperability, we're going to mandate. It has to be operable. HIPAA was an attempt, but I think HIPAA in some respects has caused more problems than not. Um, and clearly, um, the inability of this country to, to really get together and agree on not even the solution, but how to get to a, how to have a conversation about the hard problems. I mean, we just clearly in this, uh, in this dynamic, we, we have a hard time doing that if, if it's not impossible. Um, but I think the, you know, the, 
the market failure dynamic, which you've explored a lot in this podcast, and the misalignment of incentives um, is, I think, probably one of the best starting points for us. And you look at what's happened in kidney care. If you and I were to spend the rest of this podcast imagining sort of the worst healthcare system for kidney patients, I, I'm not sure, even sure we'd do justice to what we have, we've right. had here in, in the U.S., 36 million Americans with kidney disease, only 600,000 on dialysis, and yet all the time, attention, and resources have been on the dialysis population, not that 35.4 million pre, pre-dialysis. So again, market has failed. The public sector has not had a, a, an ability to sort of intervene or, or change things. And so I think that, that's the first big set of problems. Right. The second big set, and I'll shut the hell up in a second, is I think and it's related <laughs> to the first, there's no public health system in this country, right? We've, right. We are very, very good. We're, we're pretty good mechanical engineers. If there's a problem, we can fix it. Um, we are not very good at systems. We are not very good at proactive behavior. And I think that's part and parcel of how little we know as a species about uh, the human body. I mean, it's just we've um, there's so much still to discover. And so, again, if there's a crisis, the American healthcare system is about as good. It's better than anyone, any other system in terms of um, curing cancer, you know, working on sort of these these acute problems. But for chronic disease, for chronic illness, for wellness, long-term wellness, preventative care, it's not something we're any good at. And if I don't think there's a better example of what's gone on in the last th- uh, two years with the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think, you know, at the risk of, I'll try not to turn this into a polemic. I think this brings us to the third problem, which is that we seem to have lost any and all ability to respect, listen to, follow the advice of experts. Um, I don't mean to turn this into an advertisement for Michael Lewis's you know, last couple of books, but yeah, um, yeah. again, you look at what's happened in the, p- the pandemic, it's pretty abysmal in terms of where we are and who we are. So you put all of that in a stew, it's a pretty toxic mess. And I think it's a, it goes uh, a long way to explaining kind of why healthcare is so, it, it is so flawed. So we both now find ourselves um, working um, in a venture capital backed um, industry. Um, when I came to Silicon Valley three years ago, I was spent 30 years as a provider. So I really had no idea what this, um, economic vehicle was this financial vehicle for starting companies and and what its impact could be. Um, there's been a time when I've been quite cynical about it, thinking it's just, you know, somebody trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, pump and dump something and get off before somebody, you know, and, and, and sell their shares to somebody else before, um, you know, the inevitable crash comes along and, you know, you don't want to be the last person in line holding it. But I do think now after three years that there is some benefit. So I'll just ask you, can and how do these VC funded companies um, solve the problems that, that you just outlined? Um, I, I, su- I suppose the pithy answer is no, which is ironic given the, the position I st- currently sit in. But I, I, what I really mean by that is, no, they can't do it alone. There's no silver, silver bullet. It's not about data or human capital. It's about the synthesis of both. It's not about um, you know, building a platform versus uh, inpatient services. I mean, it's, 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 it's how do you bring all of this together? And so I think in that respect, Silicon Valley has an amazing amount to, to offer healthcare. Um, and I don't think you or I would be sitting in our positions today right. if we didn't believe that. Um, I mean, it's funny. I, I, I was, as I said earlier, I started in, in venture capital in about 1998, and from you know late 90s and the first part of the first decade of 2000s, you know, when you asked a venture capitalist, would you invest in healthcare? And they, under no circumstances. You know, I, sure, biotech, but yeah, there's going to be a, a big investment. You're going to right. test to see if it's if it works. You get to phase one, phase two. You sell it, as you said. You sort of pump and dump. Healthcare services is, has been so hard, and it's so it's going to take an awful long time to see a, a payoff. So I think there's been this historically there has been a, an aversion to uh, Silicon Valley investing in this. And then in the last five years, you've started to see a bunch of different things. One, you've seen you know the the rise of di- big data and you know how analytics can change things. Two, the the way in which technology can really start to change patient engagement. Three, you know, COVID has certainly exacerbated that, exacerbated or accelerated that. Um, and then three, and I suppose this is sort of unfortunate, you've seen business cycles and just the amount of money come in that has allowed people to see returns in much, much, in a much more truncated basis. Right. I think that piece is going to change. I think you're starting to see a correction, which I actually think is a very good thing for the overall ecosystem. I mean, the world is littered with the the, the carcasses of, of healthcare startups founded by smart Silicon Valley execs who had some sort of unfortunate contact with the healthcare system and said, 
I'm smart. I can do better. Right. Um, but they didn't often take the time or they just realized how hard and interconnected and complicated it is. Um, when the founders of Cricket started, I'm embarrassed to admit this story. I was at Fresenius. Someone told me about these jokers, a couple of whom came out of LinkedIn who thought they could save kidney care. I jumped online, saw their profiles and said, these guys are are fools. And why would they ever name their company after an insect? Right. You know, fast forward about five <laughs> years and I'm now leading that company, which is just, you know, a, a, a massive irony. But again, it's for us and for where we stand, we can get in kidney care a second in a second, but it's all about, this is about behavioral change and a very simple, straightforward, what I thought was profound statement um, when I joined was you can't have, you can't change behavior unless you fundamentally change the way in which we engage patients. And right. that insight is what's powered sort of all aspects of our model. Um, and it's that kind of thinking, I think, that is, is what's going to hopefully be uh, a part of the, 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 um, the secret sauce that Silicon Valley can bring to healthcare. So talk a little bit about that about that patient engagement because as I as I started following cricket that to me was really um, it was really um, the important lever that that you guys were really trying to pull. I mean, once you get to end stage kidney disease, you know, you find your way to the treatment, or the treatment finds you. You know, you get to a dialysis center, you know, or you end up in the hospital and somebody does inpatient dialysis until you get some access placed, and then you know you get assigned to either a Davida or a Fresenius center, and you spend the rest of your life every, you know, three times a week going and get dialysis, but. The, the thing I really loved about cricket when I first when I first learned about it, I was a chief population health officer for a, for a large regional health system, and to me, it seemed to be the ultimate you know uh, population health play. It's like why wait until everything is completely broke before you before you um, intervene or or you engage. So, so talk a little bit about this this engagement process and platform and and why it really makes cricket special. Yeah, I, I think you're you're right in terms of how you're diagnosing the problem with kidney care. I mean. The standard of care in kidney care is to <laughs> crash into dialysis. When the when the vocabulary is crash, you know you've got a serious, serious problem in your hands. Um, on the order of 65% of patients start dialysis because they either they show up at an, at an ER, they've got chest pains or blurred vision, they don't know what's wrong with them, and there's a simple blood test done, and the doctor says, well, your kidneys have failed, you're on dialysis today and for the rest of your life. So they either don't know they have the disease or they've never seen a nephrologist. Um, so the, in some respects, in terms of back, kind of back to the last question of can Silicon Valley save healthcare in kidney care, the bar is so low that almost any intervention is going to help. I mean, we're to the point now where just just letting people know they have the disease is a pretty big step forward. Um, but again, for us, it's there's long been a recognition that um, the United States lags the rest of the world in the the number of people who receive dialysis at home versus having to go in center. Right. Um, there's a long recognition that. Um, kidney transplant uh, rates aren't where they should be, and we lag the rest of the world. Yes, there's a dearth of kidneys, but there's also the, the referral process is, is screwed up. And again, too many people um, are diagnosed before they had a chance to get themselves, their, their meds managed, their diets in order, healthy enough to be eligible for a transplant. So the, the answer to all of this is to, as you said, not start treating a patient once they've, you know, it's too late and their kidneys have failed, but to try and go upstream and engage with them earlier. We, the broader kidney care industry, have known this for decades, but it's been really hard to do that because um, dialysis or kidney disease is such an un- and underdiagnosed um, disease state. So what Cricket tries to do is, as we think about, again, this notion of patient engagement, it, we do three things. One, figuring out who the patients are. So developing a, you know, a really rich, robust um, data and analytics capability where we can mine claims and identify just with claims uh, you know, who's got the disease and predict with a high degree of accuracy um, what stage of the disease they're at. So now we can figure out who the patients are and most importantly, who the high risk patients are. From there, we, you know, we've created a clinical model. For us, it's about trying to foster uh, relationships of trust and to really um, you know, to bolster those relationships as, as the patients progress through their disease so that they feel comfortable engaging with their care teams. So Every patient who enrolls in our platform gets a nurse, dietitian, social worker, pharmacist, and a patient peer mentor, a patient who's further along in their disease. And these are longitudinal dedicated teams so that if Bianca is your nurse day one, she's your nurse throughout your journey. So again, getting to the point where you feel comfortable talking to them about things. And the last piece is our the way in which we engage with patients. And for us, we've leaned unapologetically into technology. We have a virtual platform with a rich library of FAQs and videos um, and that we are going to 
uh, you know, that's the primary mechanism through which our patients engage with, with our clinicians. So, Bobby, I love what you're what you're saying in terms of of the approach. I left healthcare after 30 years because I believed exactly what you were saying, but I just couldn't get anybody else to believe it. And I guess the next question for you is: the status quo is is particularly in healthcare is so powerful. Um, you know, if it if it weren't so so well entrenched, I think change would be easy. And I think a, a value based approach to care, not just kidney care, but care writ large, would be would be relatively easy. So, from your perspective, in ten years, are we going to be looking back on sort of this digital health decade as a lot of talk and not much progress, or do you think we're really, you know, we're really going to turn around and say, you know what, we're at a we're at a tipping point now? And the work that we're doing, cricket in in you know specialty care, is going to be a model that's replicable and scalable. And you know, in ten years, we will see significant um, movement in 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 this value based approach. I'm not sure my friends or family would agree with me, but uh, I'm an optimist. I think we are at a tipping point. I think we are at, at we are seeing um, the the early stages of what will come. I think the easiest analogy is kind of what we saw in the late 90s with the the emergence of the internet. Um, the world did not need nine different online pet stores, and you saw a lot of them fade away. But the the functionality that they um, that they brought, the you know the the early adopter or the early companies that came out in the, in the late 90s, set the stage for what e-commerce would become. Um, a lot of those companies don't exist anymore, but the models that they created are what we're doing today and and beyond. I view the same thing here. We're at the early stages of the digital health revolution. Um, well, healthcare is slow. I was about to say I'm not imaginative to understand what it's going to look like in 10 years, but unfortunately, 10 years it probably isn't too, too different. But over the next several decades, um, clearly the way in which we are finally able to engage with clinicians uh, is, is starting to change. The fact that it's not always having to go to a doctor, that we can work with other members of a care team, the notion that especially for chronic care management, it's not seeing the the physician. It's being, you know, once a quarter, once every six months, it's being able to engage with folks, technology or actual human beings um, between appointments so that the physicians can have someone be their eyes and ears. Uh, Again, how do you help a disparate population um, have access to um, a rich library of information about their disease so they can self-educate uh, and work with their caregivers, work with their uh, their loved ones to be able to, again, be more proactive. So I think that the, the players will undoubtedly change. Hopefully cricket, you know, and the new inner well that we're creating uh, um, is enduring. We certainly think it will be. Um, but the precepts that all of us are putting in place in our various uh, specialties, I think that undoubtedly is going gonna, is gonna to survive. How do you avoid um, the... I guess, the glare of the big two in dialysis. I mean, it seems like if you're successful, well, let me rephrase that, when you're successful, um, that eventually you're going to delay um, the need for dialysis. And, and, and honestly, if you really are successful, you'll prevent the need for dialysis in a significant proportion of patients. At some point, that's going to cut into the, to the revenue streams for DeVita and Fresenius. How do you respond to that? Um, a couple of things. One, I think... We as a society, we as a, as a medical uh, um, profession, I don't think we really truly understand, um, but certainly not the holy grail of you know, arresting progression and curing kidney disease, we're not there. Um, I think that there's some really interesting things that are going to come in five or 10 years in, this, in the form of artificial kidneys that are grown in the lab, which will be just um, you know, revolutionary in the extreme. What we and others are trying to do certainly is to slow progression uh, and to um, deliver a healthier patient to kidney failure if if and when they do progress. And then as a result, give them more options, help them uh, be able to dialyze at home, um, have them be a, a more eligible uh, or, or a more attractive candidate for uh, a kidney transplant. I think, yeah, that will, it could, you could say, eat into what, you know, David and Fresenius are trying to do. But I think, I, again, I I, I worked at Fresenius for a long time. Um, we're doing a deal with a, a division of them in, in, in a bit, so I'm sure I'm going to sound like an apologist for the LDOs. But I think they're both trying to figure out what life is like in the new world order. Um, and I think they're both trying to um, figure out what value-based care could mean. Fresenius, I give them all the credit in the world. They've been very inquisitive over the last 20, 30 years. They've never spun anything out. This is their first spin out. They've recognized that this is different enough that you know doing it inside the four walls of Fresenius is not going to work. 
They need right. an own, you know, they needed to be part of creation, creating an, an independent entity that can do this on its own. And that's what this new inner well company that will be uh, that we're building. But ultimately, if we're able to do our jobs in slow progression, for an awful lot of people, we're going to be delivering a healthier patient to kidney failure. Patients are going to live longer than whether they're on conservative care, in dialysis, at home dialysis. For It's not necessarily about reducing dialysis spend. That, unfortunately, is a constant for a lot of people. It's right. reducing the inpatient spend. Dialysis is only, depending on where you know your what market is, only twenty five to thirty five percent of the total cost of care. It's really the in, the uh, inpatient spend that is so high. So if we can, again, help paper, help people be sort of healthier at home and out of the hospital, then I think everybody's better off. Can you define LDO for me? Is that Sorry, large dialysis uh, large, organization? Large dialysis organization. Uh, the way in which people refer to the big two of Fresenius and Davida. Excellent, love it. So um, let's transition a minute and, and let's talk about sort of life at the at a startup. So startups are hard. Um, yeah, there are tons of challenges. You know, some of it has to do with you know building the product or the service. Some of it has to do with with servicing customers. But there's just also the the building of a business while it's while it's doing business. So as CEO, what are some of your biggest challenges? I think it's just that it's finding what you know the the B school prof will call product market fit. You have a product, the market's need is there. Hopefully, those two things line up. If they don't, you've got a problem. Um, and for a long time, as a you know emerging growth company, you could you could work on product market fit. You could um, you could hire a couple of whiz bang marketers and go out and survey the marketplace. Things are moving too quickly now, and it's it's. You're, you're doing that sort of product market fit research at the same time you're actually building your product, selling it, and then hopefully caring for patients. The, um, it's trite, but the, the cliche of building and flying the plane at the same time is, yeah. is accurate. And it's, um, it's challenging. And it's especially challenging in a, at a time when all of healthcare, and certainly kidney care in particular, is at this, such, this amazing inflection point. And so you're trying to create your product, build it, market it and care and care for patients at the same time when the provider space is moving in a very different direction, where the payer space is moving in a very different direction. And so um, it's not even one foot in two different canoes. You've got, you know, hands, feet, it's just, it's <laughs> right. all over the place. So I think that's the biggest challenge. What's been interesting to me to watch, um, especially sort of as I've a little bit later in my career, I've had the good fortune of working in the public sector, the private sector, um, large companies and small companies. Um, this is, I suppose sounds obvious, but it's true. Startups aren't made for everyone. Um, if you're not a kind of the kind of person who can um, deal with and thrive in a world of ambiguity, it's going to be hard for you. Um, if you're the kind of person who likes predetermined metrics and you're all about um, figuring out the best way and the most efficient way of, of driving those metrics, again, that's not a startup in every way, shape, or form. So um, it is a big challenge. It's I, I think the biggest challenge we have is all that stuff we just talked about managing is hard. It's about right. attracting the right talent who can go after it and then managing it. So it's a, it's, there's a lot going on. Are you having difficulty attracting talent at this point in time? Not, not necessarily because of, of what cricket is or isn't, but because of market forces. Um, it's been a challenge. I think we are starting to see, um, there's anecdotal evidence that the recent uh, change in the public and private markets is changing the, the labor dynamic a little bit. Um, but there's no question the, the search for talent for for product folks for engineers for 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 clinicians i mean it's been it's been a beast over the last uh, 3 to 5 years all in a very good way to me what mm -hmm. the signals is again there's a lot of innovation out there there's a lot of new dynamic um, uh, people putting together companies to pursue really impressive and interesting ideas um, so it's been it's been a challenge we've been very very fortunate in kidney care especially there are an awful lot of clinicians who've worked in the traditional dialysis space who are tired of it or are looking for a different model. So we've been able to attract clinicians, um, you know, knock on wood. We've been very successful in our ability to not just attract them, but retain them. So if somebody looks you up on, on LinkedIn and, and contacts you and says, hey, you look like you've been a, a pretty successful, you know, uh, CEO of a startup. And, you know, I have a great idea for a health tech company. What advice do you have for me as a potential founder? Take a lot of deep breaths. Uh, <laughs> find a really good team. Um, yeah. Find people you like to be around because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. Find people you trust because um, you're going to be in the foxhole with them. Um, I think that's the biggest and best 
that the most important thing. I work with a lot of venture capitalists over my life, and they always say you know, the, the the age old question is: it would you, is it better to have a great idea or a great team? Um, I would start with a great team um, because you can find a good a, a good idea. I, I think it's got to be true ninety nine percent of the time. Whatever idea you idea you start with, it's going to evolve and it's going to evolve radically. And so, to be able to have creative thinkers around you, again, people you trust, people you like those ideas will come and you can pursue them quickly. Um, without that team, it's, you're going to be on your own and that, that's, that's never going to work. Gets, it can get lonely pretty quickly, I think. Yeah. So you shared a little bit at the, at the top of the episode about, um, about your father. And, you know, I find so many people who come to work in a healthcare startup have sort of this personal, you know, experience either themselves or with a family member, um, in an interesting healthcare story. And I'm, I'm curious, I mean, ALS is a, you know, is a degenerative neurologic disease. Um, it can, um, it, it can sometimes go quickly and sometimes it can become quite prolonged. I'm, I'm curious how your experience with your dad shapes sort of how you come to work every day and, and how you talk to your team and to your employees in terms of thinking about um, the patient experience and how you incorporate it sort of into the ethos of what goes on at the company. Um, it's a really good question. I, I think what I was amazed at when my father was sick, he first unfortunately had a, a stroke and then about a year later developed ALS and it's, it's mm. sort of all conflated together. But in the inpatient setting, we had some horrible experiences. It was, you know, and it's what everybody hears. The handoffs were terrible. The, the silosization between departments and specialties was awful. I remember in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning being in his, hotel, in his hospital room and he was having a he was having a problem and there was nowhere to help. And we ended up screaming and yelling and talking to the CEO of the hospital the next day. And mm -hmm. while there was, you know, there were apologies and there were corrections made, you could just tell that this is just, this is just the way things work. Um, right. and, and the problem was almost in the way in which we were uh, so indignant. And yet by the end of his life, um, as you said, it's a, it's a horrible disease. It's debilitating. Um, the wonderful thing is he was able to be home with us for an awful long time. And at the very That's end, great. When hospice came in, the caregivers, you know, in the worst possible environment for all of us, in the worst possible emotional state for all of us, these wonderful people came in and made all of the difference by making him comfortable, um, by putting him at ease, it put us at ease. And there was no cure. We all understood what was going to happen in the weeks and, and months to come. They were angels. They were just remarkable, remarkable people. And so that lesson... I haven't, I don't talk about it in those terms with, with our team. Cause I think everybody, again, what was amazing to me when my dad was going through that was how many people would come up to me and say, you know, I, I'm so sorry to hear about your father. I went through something similar with my aunt or my uncle or my sister or my brother. I'm amazed that any of us are ambulatory given all of the things that we're dealing <laughs> right. with on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we can remember that and bring empathy to what we do, um, I think we'll all be better off. And if we can have even a modicum of the care, love, support that, you know, my father's uh, hospice caregivers showed for him and for us, I mean, that's what we need. Um, so, you know, you asked at the outset, can Silicon Valley save healthcare? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a that's why I say it's part of it. It's got to bring the, the data, the rigor, the, the analytics, the platforms, um, all of that's really, really important. But unless and until you have, you synthesize the human element with all of that technology, um, you bring the empathy along with the rigor and the pathways. If you don't do that, we'll, we will absolutely fail. So that's what we talk about a lot when we talk about the synthesis of the, what is the patient interaction? It's the, it's the synthesis of the human, the human and the tech. Um, that's what I think we're trying to bring to bear. Um, and we'll see if we're successful. You know, that's, that's very interesting because from syllable standpoint, that's a lot of the way that we look at the world too, is that there's just not enough human beings to do the jobs that are necessary. Um, and, and we look at it through a, a more general lens than, than cricket does. But, you know, I think it's this, it's the same issue. There's, there's more patients with kidney disease. There's more patients on dialysis than, you know, there are enough humans to take care of them. And there are things that humans are doing that probably don't necessarily need a human being doing some of that. And some of that has to do with the issues that you touched on, like data and interoperability and HIPAA that gets in the way of, of people doing, doing really good things. So talk a little bit for me as we come to the end here about the model that you are using to try to put better information in the hands of clinicians and better information in the hands of the care team so that they can be better prepared um, to really engage engage with the the, uh, the patient population. 
Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's a, we've made some great strides, but we're by no means done. There's so much more to do. I think part of it is what I talked about earlier, being able to identify the high risk patients. If Mm -hmm. you're deploying the same level of care to everybody at the entry point, then you've missed a massive opportunity. There are going to be people who, yes, have kidney disease, but it's not progressing. It's not, there's no acute uh, event that's happening. There are those who are progressing rapidly and you need to be able to intervene. There are those who, whose likelihood of a hospitalization in the next uh, 30 days is incredibly high. There's something we need to do to intervene. So again, who are the right patients? Um, then some of it is just workflow, making it, to your point, unleashing the power of people to, to have insight and to be able to act and have a conversation. So when we're doing a patient intake, is it a, does it have to be a 90-minute conversation between nurse and patient? Mm-hmm. Or are there mechanisms, data inflows, automated um, pre-populated forms that can Put a bunch of the information in front of the, the, the clinician so that he or she can have a much more uh, fruitful and rich conversation with the patient. And then I think the, the last component for us is, uh, again, I, I, it's all interrelated. You, you've, you've identified the high-risk patient. They're on the platform. You're providing care. What sort of insights and analytics, what sort of um, capabilities can you have behind the scenes that drive alerts, that drive automated notifications to the care teams so that they can, again, intervene at the right time and not just make it a nurse has to intervene, but can you tailor it to this is a this is a social worker issue. This is a dietitian issue. This is a pharmacy issue. Mm-hmm. So that the right clinician can intervene quickly as opposed to just any clinician intervening quickly. Excellent point. Well, Bobby Sapuka, CEO of Cricket, thank you so much for taking time to be on the podcast with us. I was looking forward to this for several months now, and uh, you didn't disappoint. So we really appreciate it. And um, best of luck as you work through the details on the merger. And, um, you know, hopefully when you get that uh, all finished up and, and get that behind you, we can have you back on the podcast and you can tell us about some of the learnings that you've had in that process. I would love that. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Look forward to talking Absolutely. to you again soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care.